You're listening to Speakers at the Johnson School, where we bring you top corporate executives and their breakthrough insights on leadership, entrepreneurship, and best practices to the Cornell campus. I'd like to welcome you all to the Park Leadership Speaker Series. This is a series that is sponsored by the Triad Foundation. We appreciate their support very much. It allows us to bring to campus outstanding and accomplished speakers, such as Barry Salzberg, whom we have here today. First, I would like to just mention a couple things about the Johnson School's relation with Deloitte and Cornell's relationship with Deloitte. First, there's 180, we are told, Cornellians at Deloitte, that's a lot, 54 of whom are Johnson MBAs. Deloitte helps us by supporting lots of different things. They've supported the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the uh, golf tournament, let me see my list, Sherlow, uh, Consulting Club, lots of ways. Deloitte hosts student tracks, and this year, some of you may have attended the pre-preparation that we had for consultants uh, in Manhattan at Deloitte's headquarters in June. Did anybody, was anybody here who was at that? There are some, I see them around, okay. So we appreciate all that Deloitte has done for us. Now on to introducing Mr. Salzberg. Barry Salzberg is the CEO of Deloitte LLP, a position he assumed in June of 2007 after being part managing partner of the Deloitte U.S. firms from 2003 to 2007. He's a member of Deloitte U.S. firms board, the Deloitte Tush Tomatsu Global Executive Committee and Board of Directors. He joined Deloitte and Touche in 1977 and became a partner in 85, a blitz career. How many of you would like to become partners after only eight years at the firm? Think there are, <laughs> think twice, okay. Um, he has an impressive leadership record. In 2000, he, held, he took over the leadership of Deloitte Tax LLP practice, including the America's Tax Practice, and they moved from fourth gaining significant market share to first, so a, a pretty good record. In addition, he has outstanding education and lots of community involvement. He has degrees in accounting from Brooklyn College, a uh, JD from Brooklyn Law School, and an LLM in taxation from NYU. He's a member of New York State Bar, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. If I listed all of the things, he'd have no time to talk. I would like to just tell you a couple of the charitable and community service activities that he engages in because he's known for building opportunities for tomorrow's leaders and fostering diversity. And in those roles, he's a member of College Summit, Vanderbilt's Owen School, the Jackie Robinson Foundation, the Janetta B. Cole Global Diversity and Inclusion Institute at Bennett College, and chair of the Capital Steering Committee for YMCA of Greater, Greater New York. His title, Where Do We Go From Here, is certainly appropriate in today's economic climate. Please help me welcome Barry Salzberg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, everywhere that I go lately, uh, every time I stand in front of an audience, I seem to start with the same four words. In these challenging times. Well, they have been challenging, for sure, uh, and they continue to be, and it's not just for Wall Street. Uh, the last several weeks have really been challenging for everyone who leads a business, everyone who works for a business, everyone who is called upon to stand in front of a group of people and say something sensible about business, not to mention those of you who are contemplating your prospects for returning to business once you've received your MBA. Now, clearly, the recent economic turmoil has been unprecedented, and particularly in the financial services industry. The landscape has changed significantly as firms with long histories have disappeared or been absorbed by other entities and as investment banks have morphed into commercial banks. Now, I saw a cartoon in a recent issue of The New Yorker. It showed a man walking past a storefront labeled First National Bank and Grill. Now, <laughs> not long ago, that humor would have seemed simply absurd. But today, well, today it speaks to the uncertainty in the financial markets 
with a rather dark sense of humor. Now, I was thinking about the changing business landscape as I traveled up here today, and it occurred to me that Ithaca is a place that knows a thing or two about landscape changes. After all, as anyone who has been fortunate enough to spend time up here knows, Ithaca is gorgeous. But it wasn't always like this. Uh, tens of thousands of years ago, before the Ice Age carved these spectacular gorges, the landscape looked very different than it does today. Back then, this was a river valley. I'm going to ask you to take a moment and imagine how it would feel to live in a lush river valley. You have your little house by the river, and you love fishing and swimming, maybe paddling down the river in a canoe once in a while. And then out of the blue, someone comes along and says, sorry guys, we're doing construction here, and you can stay here, but we're turning your valley into a rocky gorge and a waterfall. So you may want to sort of sell your canoe. Now, if that happened, you probably wouldn't be very happy. But happy or not, you'd still end up living next to a gorge. So you might as well get used to it. You might, might as well get used to the view, at least until it changes again. Now, of course, that's not a perfect analogy. The gorges in this area took thousands of years to form, while the turmoil that hit the world economy seemed to happen overnight. Now, recent events have not only changed our view, they have changed our entire perspective and, in many cases, shaken confidence. We've learned that our world doesn't always work quite the way as we predicted. Markets and lending institutions don't always function as they should. And at the same time, it seems we're having a harder time just getting an accurate picture of what's going on inside our businesses or the world at large. So as leaders, what do we do? And I say we intentionally because all of us in this room are leaders and we're in this together. When you graduate and you return to full-time work, you'll have colleagues, you'll have co-workers, you'll have staff, and whatever your title may be, you can help your colleagues pull together to reach a common goal. If that's not leadership, then I don't know what is. Now, true leaders are able to bring people together around a common goal because they know what that goal is and what steps they need to reach it. To put it simply, great leaders plan. Now, at Deloitte, we have been planning for an economic downturn for a couple of years now. We plan for a number of scenarios, from mild to severe. But in the words of that great philosopher John Lennon, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Now, not one of our scenarios for the two years that we've been planning looked like the gorges you see when you look at any graph of the stock market's recent performance. Because life happens in so many unexpected ways, I subscribe to what I call flex-style leadership. Flexible leadership means keeping one eye glued on the present and the other firmly but flexibly fixed on the future. And while they're always focused on heading toward the goal, flexible leaders are always ready to duck or reorient themselves at a moment's notice. Now, I don't mean to imply that flexibility is only required in extreme situations. It's an essential element of all of our lives, one we rely on every day. Without flexibility, our hearts would be unable to pump blood, our lungs would be unable to process oxygen, and our legs would be unable to propel us forward. In short, we would be profoundly uninteresting people. Now, thinking back over my life, there have been a number of times when I've been called upon to be flexible. When I entered college, I expected to emerge as a math teacher. But after I encountered my first college-level calculus class, my plans became a bit more flexible. <laughs> now, after I became a partner at Deloitte, I thought I would spend the entire career that I would have happily serving tax clients. That's where I started my career in tax. But my mentor encouraged me to think more flexibly about my abilities, about my, my potential, and as a result, I accepted a, a management job outside of tax. Now, both of those choices, my change of college major and my change of career path, had not been in my plans earlier. But when the opportunities arose, I was able to see their merits and take full advantage of those options. Yet there were other times when I chose not to change course. Before I made partner, 
I was offered the opportunity to leave Deloitte back in 1984 and go to work for a very prestigious client that I was serving. It was a very prestigious firm. In my view, easily the most powerful firm in its industry back then, maybe even today. And it was in many ways a very tempting offer. But I decided to stay at Deloitte because I wanted to really be at the center of new developments in my profession. I wanted to work with a diverse team of colleagues and mentor young people coming up through the ranks. At my client's firm, I would have been the only person doing what I was doing. So in that sense, I would have been sort of working alone. And I guess some might say that I was inflexible then. But I'm here to tell you that staying at Deloitte was one of the best choices I've ever made. And sometimes, I guess, you need to be flexible enough to just simply stay the course. So flexibility is helpful throughout our lives. But in these challenging times, I have found it's actually essential. In fact, it's probably the quality that I've called upon most in the past few months as I am leading Deloitte through this turmoil. I became Deloitte CEO uh, 18 months ago. And I set out at that time four priorities for our organization. The priorities related to our clients and serving them distinctively, to our people, demonstrating a very strong commitment to their careers and their longevity in business, focusing on making sure that our business was growing and profitably so, and making sure that we were as efficient as we possibly could, and making sure that we were easier to do business with by our clients. Now today, these remain my strategic priorities. They have not changed. But as you might imagine, some specific issues have forced their way up my agenda over the last year. Uh, I've had to have the flexibility organizationally and personally to deal with the push-pull forces driving 21st century leaders. That is being pulled by events that are hard to foresee even as you push your own agenda throughout the organization. So what has pulled me in an unexpected direction in the last year or so? I have found myself spending much, much more time than I ever thought that I would on global matters, especially since I'm the CEO of the U.S. part of Deloitte. Now, at the same time, I have found myself dealing with regulatory issues that have put our professions squarely in the spotlight. Now, this includes implementation of fair value accounting, which has fundamental implications for the current credit crisis. It also covers conversion of GAAP to IFRS in the next few years. Actually, suddenly, if you think about it, accounting is in the headlines and on the political agenda. And you must recall, I'm a tax guy, so you have to talk about flexibility. Now, what's driving these trends? Why do I now have to work hard to keep my eye on those strategic priorities while other things sort of clamor for my attention? Well, here are a few of the prime suspects in recasting today's business agenda. First, globalization. This continues to reshape the business environment every moment of every day. We can see the results that the current crisis is having all around the world. Every economy has been affected. But even before the credit issues arose, the global business landscape was shifting. We have gone from a world in which there were three major stock markets, New York, London, Tokyo, to a world in which other financial centers are also rising to prominence. In 2007, the largest IPOs took place in China, Japan, Brazil, and Spain. Now, who would have imagined that 10 years ago. Nearly one-third of the companies that joined the Financial Times Global 500 list this year are based in emerging markets. When you rank Global 500 companies in terms of market cap, Chinese companies are number seven, Russian companies are number nine, and companies based in Brazil and India are numbers 15 and 17 respectively. Now, corporations aren't the only forces impacting global markets. I'm sure you've noticed increasing media attention to sovereign wealth funds, entities that manage the surplus wealth of governments. Now, just 10 years ago, the entire sovereign wealth sector had less than $500 million worth of assets under management. Earlier this year, that number 
rose to as high as $3 trillion. More than all of the world's hedge funds and private equity funds put together. Now today, of course, almost everyone has seen the value of their portfolios kind of plummet. In fact, I'd venture to guess that if five of you pooled whatever spare change in your pockets you might have, you might have more assets than some hedge and private equity funds. But my point is that wealth has become more global. And even with all that has gone on this fall, the sources for investments are far more varied than they have ever been before. And there's a new set of power brokers emerging in the world. They are becoming and will be serious players in the world's business and economic markets. And apart from influencing the markets, they're going to be our clients. So understanding the effects of globalization is key. In fact, I know many of you have heard of Tom Friedman, expert on globalization. He put it very well in a recent column analyzing the global financial crisis. He wrote, quote, it will be a world in which America will not be able to scratch its ear, let alone roll over in bed, without thinking about the impact on other countries and economies. And it will be a world in which multilateral diplomacy and regulation will no longer be a choice. It will be a reality and a necessity. We are all partners now. We are all partners now. I believe we will be reminding ourselves of that going forward quite a bit. The next issue I find myself spending a lot of time on is complexity. One of the challenges of any leader is recognizing that no matter how much you know about your organization, there's always going to be something that you don't know. That's always been true, but as computer modeling of financial instruments has grown more and more powerful, a greater range of possibilities has emerged, giving us new instruments like collateralized debt obligations, built with risk models that even some of their own creators didn't seem to understand fully. Now that puts CEOs and CFOs and boards in really tough positions. How do you know what you don't know? And how do you spot what you don't quite see? Think about that. And there's a third issue, less volatile than the others, but just as real, and this is demographics. The American workforce is starting to contract. There are 76 million baby boomers, boomers, and in just about a year, the oldest of us will reach retirement age. And the problem is, there are only about 46 million workers between the ages of 24 and 40, which are not nearly enough to replace the entire boomer generation. By 2010, there will be 31% fewer 35 to 45 year olds than there were in 2000. So the bottom line here is that as scary as the economic climate seems at times, remember that you have demographics on your side. Because within the next five years, American businesses will find themselves short millions of knowledge workers. Now it is true that the overall population of workers continues to grow, but it's growing much more slowly than we're accustomed to. The non-agricultural labor pool will grow by just 1.3% annually between 2007 and 2015. Now unfortunately, most non-agricultural businesses will need to grow a lot faster than 1.3% a year. So you can see this gap. Even in this economic environment at Deloitte, we foresee that the growth of our own business will be much faster than 1.3%. Now that's overall growth. Some of our businesses will grow even faster than that. So one lesson we've learned from previous downturns is that we've got to keep the talent pipeline open. So even in the practice areas whose businesses have slowed, we're still doing our best to retain our highest performers. Because once the economy rebounds, we want to be able to get on the road quickly and get back to serving the demand that exists in the marketplace. So globalization, complexity, demographics, these are three forces that have largely shaped my first year and a half as the CEO of Deloitte's US operations. We have 43,000 people, including a 6,000 employee base in India. 
and I expect that they will continue to figure prominently in the foreseeable future. Now, what does that future hold? Now, I don't have any earth-shattering pronouncements for you today. With all the unexpected events we've seen recently, I think you'd be a fool to predict anything more specific than expect snow in Ithaca this winter. <laughs> so no predictions, but I do have some beliefs I'd like to share with you. First, I do believe that the financial services industry will rebound, but it will take a totally different shape tomorrow. I believe businesses will rebound as the credit crisis is resolved over the next six to 10 months. And I believe that there are still great opportunities in the business world for talented, flexible people like you. Now, it is true that in the near term, the landscape we see will not be the landscape we're used to. And the opportunities that it offers us may be different than the opportunities we expected. But my advice to you is be flexible, be open, and you'll find the right one. Now, I know you've gotten a great foundation in your MBA program here, and I wish you the best as you put all of that knowledge to work. So my parting thought is good luck and thank you, and I'll be happy to take all of your questions for the next 40 minutes or so. Thank you. for questions. I'm going to, uh, Clint Seidel is going to help me pass this around. I'm going to ask you to speak into this for your questions. And I'm happy to take questions on topics that I spoke about and any other topic, but I am not a technical auditor. So if you think that I am, <laughs> don't ask me questions about that. Okay. Questions? Any question will do. <laughs> Thank you. Right over there. Yeah, please, because it's being recorded. So we need that mic for you. Who wants to join the queue so that we know where your questions are? Can I go? I do, and I, appreci I appreciate the <laughs> okay. question. Um, so you spoke a lot about being flexible and then decisions about not being flexible and how that got you to a good point, too. In the ki kind of current job market that's going on, um, how do you advise people who maybe have jobs that they're not thrilled about and whether or not they should be flexible and take those or hold out for what they really want. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, for, first off, I do think that um, success in any job requires passion. And if you don't have the passion for that job, it is, I won't say likely that you will not succeed, but it is certainly likelier that you will not succeed. And, and so, if you're talking about me personally, I would not like to go into a role that I did not like and that I felt that was not matching my career interests, my skill sets, my own passion. And so I might continue, if it was me, I might continue to look for where my heart uh, wants to take me. Now I'll give you uh, an example of my son. My son graduated Columbia University undergraduate, wonderful liberal arts program with a computer science degree. Um, and he decided that he wanted to uh, really pursue his own interests. He had three offers from Goldman Sachs, from Lockheed Martin, and from another uh, aerospace uh, organization uh, in computer development. But he looked at those companies, and those were the only offers he had on the table. And he turned, and they were wonderful offers. <laughs> and he turned to me and he said, I don't think that I want to go in that direction. I said, but Sean, you've got a job offer, you know? <laughs> and he said, I don't want to go in that direction. I really want something less formal, much more creative oriented. And he held out and managed to find his, a job in a startup internet storage company that he is most happy about, got the offer, and is there now. Uh, and so I have to go with that story and my own instinct to suggest that I would wait. But that doesn't mean that you should wait. And you need a. <laughs> You need to think about your own situation. <laughs> okay, next question. Yes, please. Thank you. Spoke a little bit about fair value accounting, and we've heard a lot about it in the news as well. Uh, there's other options people are talking about. Uh, and what role do you think fair value had to play in the crisis, and what, what do you recommend? Do away with it? Keep it? Thank you. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's important to appreciate that it can't possibly be that fair value accounting created the crisis. 
it could be that fair value accounting brought some of the issues that created the crisis to the table and to the forefront. And that would be my, my point of view with respect to the whole concept of fair value accounting. Uh, having said that, I'm, and, and again, not um, a, a study of the specifics of fair value accounting, you have to believe that when those rules came out, it wasn't intended to be in an environment where in the entire market is illiquid. And so in a, in a totally illiquid market, you would think that perhaps the rules would be different than what it would be in a unique situation, in an illiquid investment, in a liquid market. Uh, and so I do think that as a result, there's likely to be some changes, some modifications, some explanations. But I, I actually believe that the, 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 the principles of fair value accounting will, in fact, stay. If you also believe that there will be convergence of IFRS and GAAP, um, IFRS is largely founded on valuation principles as well, similar to fair value accounting. And so unless there is a global interactive kind of conclusion to, to not stay with fair value accounting, it will also undo the potential convergence of those two regimes, which I think ultimately is good for business uh, in a stable market. Please. Hi, you mentioned um, one of the skills that led to your success of where you are now is in the when to know to be flexible and when not to be flexible. What other skills do you think um, helped get you to the position you are now? Um, so this would be skills that people would tell me that got me there, right? Um, I think, I think it's, it's people skills. Uh, it's very important when you're in a people business as we are that your, your values are very much aligned with a people business. Uh, commitment to people, learning and development, mentoring and coaching. And I think uh, over my career, uh, when it was easy to say I just want to serve clients, I was in classrooms teaching. I was uh, counseling with, with professionals to help them with their own careers and their decisions. So I think a people orientation is a very important uh, aspect too. Uh, I think that um, having an ability to, to socialize, having an ability to network, now it's different than what I'm talking about in terms of people skills, is very important uh, to, to be successful in a business like ours. So it's, it's how do you interact with uh, potentials? How do you interact with existing clients? How do you um, deal with conflict and network to be able to resolve it? I think those are very important uh, skills that I, I'm, I was told that I possess, um, <laughs> being a little bit humble about it. Uh, I, I would say that also you really need to have a good business sense. Um, the one thing we talk about at Deloitte that, that is important to us is not to be siloed in your thinking, not to be parochial in your point of view. So if you are a tax person, you shouldn't be just thinking about the tax business. You should be thinking about Deloitte broadly as we, we have so many businesses, uniquely such, that the value that we bring to our clients is in the breadth of those businesses. So we talk about people that are parochial and siloed, and I think part of what a, a, a successful leader would have is the ability to think across businesses and to be business savvy broadly uh, in terms of their thinking and their, their, their overall uh, contributions to an organization. So I would say that you know, those would be a couple that, that come to mind. Obviously, when you're in a client service business, the person who makes it to the top started serving clients daily, you know, religiously, consistently. And undoubtedly, you have to bring good client service skills, competencies, technical skills to the table to be first noted. Uh, and so I would say that you know, early on in my career, I was well noted for that. Um, and so I would say that that would be uh, obviously foundational uh, in, in that regard. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. You touched on this a little already, but I'm wondering if you have any specific examples of how the economic crisis has affected your business, maybe how Deloitte is responding. Um, so public knowledge, I'm happy to share, right? <laughs> and so uh, we audited uh, Fannie Mae, we audited uh, Merrill Lynch, we audited Bear Stearns, and we audited WAMU. 
the luck of the draw, you know? <laughs> and, and so uh, clearly from, from a, a, a business continuity perspective, as it relates to audit revenue from those clients, things will change. Uh, to what degree, it, it varies depending upon which of those companies you're talking about. But because we have a very diverse portfolio, uh, we immediately are able to transfer revenue lost in one business to revenue gain in another service area. So consulting and tax are really doing extraordinarily well at Deloitte right now. Uh, and both of those businesses are able to drive relationships uh, in uh, companies broadly, that particularly ones that we don't audit. So just take consulting, for example. Uh, right now, our consulting business is about 99% revenue from non-attest clients. So in an environment like this where a lot of the, the lost revenue directly as a result of the crisis is an audit, we have a, you know, an inventory of, of competencies that we can deliver to those clients and leverage off of the relationships that we have, and we're doing that. Um, similarly, in, in any crisis like this, which exacerbates an economic downturn, which we had experienced before the crisis, um, you obviously have a, a lower growth rate overall. That means that you need to watch your expenses more, make sure your infrastructure doesn't get uh, out of alignment with the, the demand for revenue that you have. You've got to be very sensitive to how, how long you want to be in people uh, because to the extent that uh, there are uh, excess capacity, you need to make business decisions about whether that's a good thing or not thing and how long do you keep people uh, hoping that the economy turns around, because the one thing you don't want to do is to, you know, realign your workforce and then, you know, three months later, realign it again in the other direction. That's costly and, 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 and employee morale, uh, you know, negative. So uh, those are, all of that together is, impact, is, is, is impacting our business. Now, what are we doing to respond? We're managing our business prudently. We're very aggressive in the marketplace, particularly in the non-attest areas. We are very much a relationship organization right now, so we're driving new business opportunities that we have not had before. We've, I'm not going to say the new clients because that's kind of some of that's not public, but I would suggest to you if you think about where would you think today in the economic crisis that we are experiencing, there would be opportunities. Federal government, you know, a lot of opportunity there. Think about what industries are booming right now. Oil and gas is hot. Technology is still hot. Um, so in our business, if you're in Houston and Dallas, you have no idea that there's a financial crisis going on. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you're in Detroit, you do. And so it's a matter of which businesses, and so we're making sure we're staying very close to the opportunities. So that would be sort of a, I can go on, but... Um, you, you're like the lead board member of Deloitte asking me that very question just a week or so ago. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to speak to us today. I know we all appreciate it. I think you've talked about being in client service, and uh, a lot of us in this room are probably going to, if not client service-based companies, certainly client-facing uh, individual roles. And I was wondering, from your point of view, what makes great client service? that's transferable across industries? What really makes you stand out as someone who is, is great at service? Um, I, I would say that the number one thing that makes you best, and, and by the way, I'm going to skip the technical competency because that to me is foundational. The quality of what you do and your ability to serve clients, that's foundational and that's across uh, any, any such uh, spectrum. Uh, the number one thing that I would put on the table after that is responsiveness. Uh, we have checked this out with our clients in surveys, and we asked them, what is, in your view, the most important differentiating factor amongst your service providers? And by a wide margin, it was responsiveness. And so as you're delivering service to clients, uh, I would say that being responsive, which doesn't mean answering the phone only when the client calls, it means being proactive, thinking about their business, anticipating their needs, demonstrating to them that you can be there when they need you, and getting out in front of it before they ask. And that, to me, would be number one. Now, in this same survey that we, we did, the other three factors that, that came up in lesser 
importance but still very high on the scale would be industry knowledge and so to be a really good client service provider you have to understand the industry in which the client is in and share with them trends and benchmarks and best practices knowledge of the industry the third would be understanding and perspective of their business activities that doesn't necessarily mean their industry needs it might mean their operational needs their internal organizational needs uh, things of that nature that would be number three uh, and then I would say broadly in this survey the fourth which is not specifically in response to your question but having the right team uh, wh what do we mean by that today the best client service provider doesn't answer all the questions years ago you were a jack of all trades and a master of none and your clients expected you to know everything today they expect a, a true client service provider to be essentially called a quarterback where you are servicing them in your particular area of competency but the moment you spot another need for them you're there to bring in another specialist and work together as a team to serve their needs uh, we call that bringing the right team uh, to bear so that's how I would answer the question based upon recent survey that we did this coming right from our clients uh, for me personally uh, in serving clients it was about thoughtful analysis it was about responsiveness it was about fair fees uh, you lose clients quickly uh, over disputes regarding fees uh, and so being fair both sides uh, and being open and transparent about that would be uh, important as well so just a couple yeah right in front yeah Thank you. Um, I think you probably touched on this a little bit, but my question was, do you, um, how do you, you mentioned keeping your high potentials. How do you do that in these type of times when perhaps, say, the specialty they were in goes away? You mentioned Detroit. How mm -hmm. do you manage that? Well, uh, first off, uh, we are fundamentally in a sound business. And so notwithstanding revenue that is less growing, we're still growing. Uh, and so you still need people. You need more people than you needed the year before to service your business. So uh, we are not looking to, to ask high performers to leave this organization, period, end of story, no matter where they are. And if they're not in a high growth business and we don't need them in that business because it's, we have enough people that are also high performers, we'll ask them to move. We'll redeploy them into other business areas. We'll retool them, retrain them uh, to, to maximize their, their, their contribution ability. In some cases, uh, particularly today, a good example I can give is in our merger and acquisition business. We are way long in people because transaction business is way down right now. But I know, and you know, that transaction businesses will come back, maybe in a different form, maybe a different kind of transaction world that we'll be in, but it will come back. So you need those people when it comes back. So we're keeping them in M&A and, you know, saying we need you on this particular project for a short period of time. And, and you'll go back to M&A later. So it's redeploying, it's reassigning, uh, and making sure that they're not being demotivated. The one thing you don't want to do is keep highly rated people on the beach for too long because they will be you know, uh, demotivated, and they'll, they'll go somewhere where their talents will be needed. So it's finding that right balance. But the redeployment, reassignment would be two of the, the areas. I see a microphone right in your hand. Yes, um, I've been a part of several programs that Deloitte has, has sponsored in relation to diversity, and I just wanted to thank you for being a champion of diversity. I would like to ask you, you know, how, especially in these challenging times, do you continue to commit to both diversity and, and corporate responsibility, um, you know, when maybe resources, business resources um, are, are being strained? You know, uh, I would put that in probably one of my top five challenges. Uh, diversity, corporate responsibility, community involvement, there's a whole variety of things that really define your culture, define your values, define who you are uh, and it's so easy to the operating leaders that are responsible for our P&L to say well I'm glad you're interested in that Barry but if you want me to produce a bottom line profit I think we have to stop that for some period of time 
And, and my view of that is you can't. You can't. Because if you stop recruiting, just as an example, at a particular location that you really want to recruit from, even if you stop for one year, your reputation is marred. Your approach to commitment is demonstrated, and they won't come. And the same thing in these areas. And so if you take your foot off of the, the pedal, off of those areas, you wind up taking more steps back and all the progress and all the value associated with that to your people, to the market, the clients, uh, go away. Uh, and so my message to our people is we can be more efficient and we have to grow our way out of this crisis, not cut every non-client service activity. So that won't work. So, um, and the way to do that is through tone at the top. I constantly reinforce it. All of my messages uh, include reference to my commitment to diversity, going back to specifically uh, that piece of it. Um, I attend all of our diversity training programs, either live or virtually. Um, and, and I make sure that I am visible at Alpha, at NABA, at, at, every, at now Ascend, which is the new uh, Asian American uh, uh, organization. If we're not visible there, it will be known that we don't really care. Uh, and so I think it's about um, tone. It's about continuing. You can't shut the spigot. You got to keep on going. Yeah, thank you. Could you speak a little bit about what separates a high performer versus a leader, and how do you distinguish between the two? You know, high performers are um, sort of excellent in one thing. So if they're a client, if you're talking about client service, and, and, and you've got somebody who produces the revenue, pro broadens the relationships, produces quality work. They're a high performer. The high performer becomes a leader when they do more than that. They've got to be broader. They've got to be more savvy than, than I don't mean to be pejorative, a one-trick pony. Right? You have to be able to extend, go back to the question that was asked earlier about attributes. What, what are the things that make, uh, what, what I felt made, made me a, a leader? Uh, and, I, and I think those differentiate a high performer. There are more high performers than there are leaders. And you kind of narrow down based upon your definition of leadership as to who of those high performers meet that definition. And I, I think it's about breadth. I think it's about savvy. I think it's about um, all the other attributes that I mentioned before that don't necessarily go along with a high performer. It can, but not necessarily. I think we got one right here. Thank you for coming. Um, you mentioned the technology industry, the energy industry. You know, those are two industries that are doing, doing, well. doing well by our standards at this moment. Um, you know, in general, the clients that you have, what are corporations' top couple of concerns at this moment with the economy? Well, um, I, I've got to believe that the number one concern is liquidity, right? Um, companies that, that um, can't go into the markets and borrow to maintain their operational, uh, you know, flow. So I would say that that's number one. And those companies that have lines of credit uh, that are large, drawing down on them has sort of effects also on liquidity markets, maybe not theirs, but, but broadly. So I would say liquidity is number one. Um, number two is um, the cascading effect of, of this crisis. So uh, a, an example that I can give you is the automotive industry is struggling right now here in this country. The cascading effect of that is all the suppliers of the automotive industry will soon struggle if the automotive industry isn't turning around, because who are they going to supply to? And so companies that are dependent on other industries or other organizations within their own industry that are not performing well, they're worried about the cascading effect into their organization. So that would be a second thing that comes to mind. Uh, I do think that the, the whole talent issue is a big deal. There isn't one client that I go to where we just talk about the environment, where they don't talk about talent, where they don't talk about employee morale right now, where they don't talk about retaining high performers, 
where they don't talk about the impact on their longevity if they can't recruit as many people as they were recruiting the year before. Uh, these, are, these are all concerning. And when you think about the, dem in my speech I mentioned demographics, that gap is, is going to be big. And companies that are visionary and thinking about it are now, this economic crisis exacerbates that worry because it makes it current, and they make it, it makes it real. So I would say uh, talent is, is something that's uh, foremost on their mind. And then last I would say operating efficiency. Uh, every company that I speak to is trying to figure out how to become more efficient, how to make more, uh, you know, improve their margins uh, on, a, on a regular and consistent basis. Uh, I think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to get the U.S efficiencies up. People, companies can really drive their infrastructure, could drive their processes, could drive their whole approach to delivering uh, uh, goods and services to the market uh, that would improve their margin, make them more efficient, and, and ultimately make the, the U.S. economy much more competitive than it has become. So I think it's once in a lifetime. Yeah. Um, as the workforce does shrink and the priorities of the younger workforce are different than maybe the older generations, what do you see Deloitte doing differently to sort of recruit and retain those new employees? Um, you know, fr frankly, the Generation Y employee is a different kind of person. Um, <laughs> and and, and the, 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 the company that will succeed in the future in the talent market will figure that out quickly and adapt to the changing needs of the workforce rather than vice versa. And I think over the years, um, people have adapted to the company's culture. I actually think that going forward, companies are going to need to adapt more to the needs and wants of Generation Y. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that in the Deloitte context. So uh, I'm a reasonably conservative guy. And, and somebody brings an idea to me about uh, a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago. Uh, that I said, absolutely, no way, not going to do it. Uh, and then they convinced me that I'm not with it, and so I changed my view. And this was what we, we called the Deloitte Film Festival. We actually had all of our people uh, uh, compete in the creation of a video that was, what, what's your Deloitte? What, what about Deloitte do you like? And we wanted to use that in recruiting um, and in orientation. We had, uh, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 people actually team and create videos. Now, that's the current generation. This isn't, don't, don't, don't ask me. <laughs> this is what's important to the current generation and, and that kind of communication vehicle. So that's a good example. Another example is we created our own equivalent of Facebook, if you will, call it D Street, that's what we call it, where, where you have your profile up on our internal uh, network and you put all of your personal information, you know, I speak German, I do this, I have this, and you can have chats with people and you can uh, email with people to, to, to learn who, who the people are within Deloitte that look and feel like you to make the world a little bit smaller. Uh, and, and so those are just two minor things, but in the scheme of things, we really need to, to figure that out. The most important issue we're hearing from Gen Ys today is flexibility. Uh, while every new employee wants to work hard, they want to know that at the right time in their career progression, instead of just forcing their way up the ladder, they can go a little bit sideways, take a respite, and then go back up again. Whether it's women that are having children, whether it's professionals that are taking care of their parents, whether it's I want to stop and I want to uh, you know, go do a, uh, work in my family business. before I, I mean, there's lots of different reasons why people don't want to continue up on a corporate ladder. We're calling it migrate in a corporate lattice instead. And we're calling that mass career customization, where every employee customizes their own career plan, including time and grade and, and time off and things of that nature. Um, that's important to, to the current generation. And so the, every organization that wants to retain more and more of these people will need to embark upon more and more of these approaches that directly respond to to those needs. And so um, those would be, for example, at Deloitte, three things that we think are big and important uh, for our workforce. Uh, and more will come uh, as times go by. 
mic right here. There's one right here. I don't know. Does someone else have a mic? No? Okay, so right here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move away slightly from talent management. You mentioned before the tremendous growth in sovereign wealth funds. So I was wondering, um, with the current crisis, um, do you foresee them playing a greater role um, in terms of investing and so forth? And if so, I guess my question is, how welcoming do you think the U.S. will be? Uh, the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, I do believe that sovereign wealth funds, one, because of their uh, expansive wealth and their willingness to make broad investments and their desire to get good returns in a down economy I think we're going to see more uh, more of that so the first question is yes the US's view on this is sort of conflicting between welcoming foreign investment and national security now I, it, it's it's kinda hard to, to to compare the two but that's the kind of analysis that is being done to determine whether and to what extent the U.S. would be more open to uh, foreign investment from sovereign uh, wealth funds. Uh, you know, there was one transaction, I'm, I'm weak on remembering names, but one transaction where a sovereign wealth fund wanted to invest in the ports uh, in New York area, and, and the federal government basically said no. Now, there'll be situations like that. Uh, I'm quite confident of that. But uh, on the other hand, there'll be many situations where I think um, uh, it will be welcomed. The trick, I believe, going forward is on transparency. Uh, the issue, in large part, if you take national security off of the table, is the transparency of the financial investment, the, the nature of the investment, the, the return that's, that's sort of uh, part of the investment, uh, the motive of the investment, uh, et cetera. And I, I don't, I don't profess to understand it all, but I was in Davos last year at the World Economic Forum, and that was the topic uh, on the agenda. And the debate was between national security, transparency, and foreign investment into the U.S. That's the debate. And I think it'll continue for a while until some principles are developed, but ultimately I believe it will be welcomed. We have a mic all in the back, or is that going to be too hard to get one back there? You've been very patient waiting to... The question I had was, um, I didn't want to get uh, political or anything, but based on this upcoming election cycle, I know there are certain candidates promoting certain types of policies for America's future. And my question was, like, uh, what would be more beneficial to your business in the long term, higher taxes and more regulation or lower taxes or less regulation? How would that affect jobs in terms of the amount of money you would have from profits to um, distribute to your employees or the lack of thereof? You are kidding. <laughs> um, the, the foundation of American principles is not to disclose who you are voting for. But um, having said that, having said that, I, you know, broadly speaking, if you think about uh, uh, businesses, uh, most most businesses would conclude that the the views expressed by the Republicans. Uh, would be more aligned with the, the long-term success of those businesses and ultimately the economy. Um, and therefore would resist higher taxes, would resist more regulation, uh, and so forth. I think that's just a general view uh, of businesses. Um, for me, I've got you know, mixed reactions for Deloitte because for Deloitte itself, we have um, obviously a regulated business and we have non-regulated businesses. Our regulated business um, is very regulated right now and if it gets more regulated uh, it will be complex for us for sure. Harder, more costly, uh, maybe not necessarily resulting in a lot of value to the to the investing public. It depends on what that is. If you think more regulation broadly for uh, business uh, is, is, is ultimately a good thing. For us at Deloitte, it could be a very good thing because if our, bus if our clients are more regulated, they need more consultants, they need more compliance, they need more controls, they need a lot more that we have to provide. And since our audit business is only 
30% of our total revenue, um, we would have lots of good opportunities associated with an environment in which there was more, uh, more regulation. So, you know, you've got to look at it from sort of both sides and, and hard to draw a conclusion. Um, uh, and I'm not going to predict who's going to win, but it seems pretty likely that one candidate is going to win uh, <laughs> right now. So, yes, ma'am, please. <laughs> Uh, you talk about um, global globalization, um, emerging market. My question is, what challenge your company for globalization? How you handle the global business? Thank you. Yeah, um, we have a number of challenges in the emerging markets and globalization. First, uh, we are uh, structured country by country. That's a challenge. Uh, so when you don't have an integrated financial and managerial organization, uh, it's, it's definitely on a, you know, harder to manage and harder to uh, invest uh, broadly because you can't ask the Indian partnership to invest in India because they don't have what to invest until they invest and succeed at it. And so you have to figure out a way in an organization to fuel that growth uh, and, and create an environment that they can succeed in. Uh, and so in an organization like ours, it's much more complicated. So that would be challenge number one. Challenge number two, I was in, uh, I think it was Professor Peck's class a little bit earlier, and, and, and there was a, a, a case study uh, about, about uh, high growth and the impact on high growth in the infrastructure of the business. Uh, and, and a high growth emerging market is no different than a high growth company. And, and the challenges that you have in driving a high growth environment to the infrastructure, the human resource function, the organizational structure and process and, and so forth is extremely complicated. So when you're growing 40% a year like our China and India practices have been, there comes a point where you have to be very careful about the infrastructure growing at the right rate the human resource function growing at the right rate, the quality function growing at the right rate to make sure that those businesses are, are successful. So um, the infrastructure growth is another big challenge and the ability to do that as quickly as the growth occurs. And then the third challenge is what we're facing right now because China and India and Russia, for example, have not been spared the economic crisis that we have in this country. The consequence of that is when you were growing at 40% and 40% and you, you grew your business base, your people complement to drive that and now all of a sudden that 40% becomes nine, uh, it becomes much more difficult to sustain that uh, and it requires a bit of, of challenge. And then last, um, in these emerging markets, they're not very stable business environments yet. And because they're not stable business environments yet, your client relationships in many of these places aren't built on long-standing relationships. So the volatility in, in turnover and client relationships is, is strong. And if those companies aren't themselves doing well, and in an environment like this, it's possible and most likely that they won't, the, the time frame within which they pay their invoices increases and the cash flow of an emerging market decreases and in an emerging market, it may be very difficult to manage that. Um, and particularly in certain of the markets, a little bit easier in China, a lot harder in Russia, as, as two, two examples. So those would be, yeah, okay, please, thank you. Hi, thank Hi. you for coming out. And uh, on a related note to that, have you seen the competitive landscape of the competitors you're competing with change as a result of the new global business? And how are you aligning your company to adapt within that? Well, um, we have, because of our businesses, we have changes that we make in terms of our structure and any changes that we make in terms of how we facilitate investments in emerging markets in support of a global uh, cross-border client service delivery mechanism uh, will be to move where we are one step further, not to go to where they are. Uh, and so we have to look at what our culture is, what, what works for us. We have to look at what our our member firms around the network um, will best 
uh, uh, need, will need in order to best execute against this. And so uh, I think that you're going to see, at least in the big four, more integration rather than less uh, and more uh, connectivity between larger mature markets in those networks and the smaller uh, emerging markets uh, in their networks. Because I don't know how else you can do it barring a full financial integration, which in today's economic environment is highly unlikely. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks for being here. You talked a lot about the different businesses you have. In fact, it sounds in some ways like you're above the business cycle. What are some of the challenges, though, that you have in providing so many different services within your firm and, and managing that? Uh, well, it, it is a challenge because we have, within each of those four businesses, broadly four businesses, we've got multiple businesses. So even within consulting, we've got a technology business, which is totally different than a strategy and ops business. Uh, within within um, tax, we've got um, a compliance business and we've got consulting businesses. Uh, and even within our financial advisory businesses, we've got a forensic and dispute services and we've got valuation services and corporate finance. So there's more than four. So it is a wide array of of businesses and the, the complexity is in in a couple of areas first it's in the HR model and the one thing that we learned is you cannot have one HR model to fit all businesses uh, and any and if you try to do that you'll fail uh, we tried a little bit of that years ago it doesn't work the model in corporate finance is totally different than the model in audit uh, and and so you have to have distinctive uh, uh, models and an HR focus in those businesses. But they have to be as consistent so that you don't have 30 firms, you have one Deloitte, right? And so that's, that's a very big challenge, but that's, that's one of the areas that you, we, we kind of work on. The other, the other uh, issue is in the compensation structure. Um, an auditor out of undergraduate school, uh, first time working in the workforce, would command a different salary than a consultant first time in the workforce coming to Deloitte as a first year employee different model. And so when you have that, and in some cases they're sitting next to each other, that creates a challenge and, and one that's difficult, exacerbated by the need to hire experienced people. So when you hire experienced people in one of those businesses, it's very likely that you'll be paying them more than a similarly experienced person in another business that was homegrown. And there's nothing at Deloitte that is a secret. It's only who doesn't know yet. And so you just kind of have to understand that and manage your, your, your businesses accordingly. So I would say that that's another challenge, the compensation structure. Corporate finance people get paid differently than, than others. And if you don't pay them the way they would get paid if they went somewhere else to do that work, you won't get them. So you, you've got to be, be uh, uh, visionary about that. Um, the risk profile is different for each of those businesses much riskier to serve an audit client and sign a financial statement than it is to do a consulting project. Much riskier. The consequence of that is you've got to have very different terms and conditions, engagement letter, uh, contractual provisions. You've got to have a very different risk management profile within the organization and quality assurance and one size doesn't fit all. So maybe if you put it all together, my best answer to you is you cannot manage the business like peanut butter. You can't spread it across the whole thing. It's got to be different, distinct, unique. We have time for one more question. We've got one right over here. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Where you see yourself after 15 years, or if I may rephrase it, uh, what are the fields you think you would be working in after 15 years? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear it. <laughs> that microphone doesn't work, so you have to just speak okay. up a little bit. Sorry. So where you see yourself uh, after 15 years? If I, if 15 I, years from now? Yeah. Or is what kind of fields you would be working, you think, after 15 years? And you want me, me personally? Exactly. Well, first off, in 15 years, I'm long since gone from Deloitte. That's for sure. <laughs> um, we have mandatory retirement age. I'm 55. Mandatory retirement age is 62. The longest I can go is seven more years. So um, I know exactly what I'm going to do after I retire, uh, and that is to, to teach. I am going to be in business school. 
uh, and I'm going to take the skills that I've been able to develop and learn and redistribute it. And that's what I want to do. So, uh, no, <laughs> I kind of like it warmer than, okay, so the likelihood is no, but I appreciate the offer. I think that was the last question. Thank you very much.